wait for the recording. Okay, the recording is on. Uh, welcome everyone to BC310, our course on church and ministry administration. Let's take a moment just to pray together and then we will um, get started, please. Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to get together and learn, study, be equipped, uh, even with these practical thoughts and ideas. And Lord, as we continue to listen and learn and share, uh, may we find these useful, Lord, in, in the work you call each of us to do, and maybe be able to use this to serve you well and to serve people well. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So last week we started talking about culture, um, the, the kind of culture we create, uh, both within the organization, the Christian organization, and also within the church community, the congregation. Right. So, so if you're doing, if you're, if you're talking about a church, that would be uh, the church organization and also the church community. You know, if you're talking about a Christian ministry, some, um, not necessarily a church ministry, but you know, if somebody is doing some other kind of work, then of course we talk about culture in the terms of the organization and in terms of uh, the p way they interact with uh, the people who are being served through that organization or uh, the partners who are working with the organization and so on right so we're talking about culture let's um, cover more more ground and then we can have time for questions and so on so i'm sharing the uh, document that we uh, are using for our lectures so when we're talking about culture we said we're talking about these shared values and things the practices, the way things are done, the way people behave, uh, the pe way people interact, uh, the, 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 their perspectives, the, the, what they believe, uh, the rituals within the organization, right? And, uh, and so this is very important because uh, it affects how people, uh, people's experience within the organization, so especially employees, people are staff, church staff, they're working, you know how they uh, the environment in which they work is largely de determined by the culture of the organization and if the culture is healthy people enjoy working otherwise uh, you know people will find it a very toxic culture there's too much of uh, stress or competition or rivalry or politics or all kinds of you know, negative things then it's very difficult to people for people to work uh, culture also affects how we deal with uh, the people who are, whom we serve. Uh, we try to do that in a, in a healthy way uh, and uh, uh, and so on. And then when we have a, a, a really good, strong organizational culture, usually the culture in, in many, many, many cases, it protects itself, helps protect the organization. So when somebody comes in, uh, with certain behaviors that don't fit into the culture, either they have to change that behavior to adapt to the culture, or uh, sooner or later they may just find that they don't fit within the organization. Right? It can happen uh, both ways, uh, and so culture is very, very, very important. Even from that perspective, it, it helps protect the organization from negative influences if you have a healthy culture and a strong healthy culture right and uh, we we talked about the first point last week saying that you know uh, when we when we try to think about what shapes the organization culture the culture of the organization first we said it starts with the leaders uh, the leadership if we uh, model the behavior and we actually live out the kind of culture we want to have in the organization, then people will begin to take on that same culture, right? And so as leaders, we have to think very intentionally on what is the kind of culture we want to have. 
what is the kind of culture we want to have in the organization, in the community, and let's try to develop that. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. It usually takes a long period of time uh, for that culture to really, you know, take shape and form and to come to become strong. Right. And there will be lots of things that try to disturb that culture, but you know, we have to stay with it. And uh, and, and and then as we model it, model it, uh, then then soon people begin to embrace that. They begin to understand it. Uh, they begin to recognize that the culture, uh, what the culture is, and therefore it dictates our behavior, our actions, our decisions, and then we're able to create that. Right? So it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Right? Uh, but it starts with the leaders. And so we were talking, just sharing some examples last week. Uh, for instance, we talked about avoiding uh, a celebrity culture, right? We don't want to make our leaders as celebrities. So just, just be normal. Like we, we, we call it level ground. That means we're all walking on level ground. We're all walking at the, the same level. I mean, yes, in one sense, uh, there are roles and responsibilities which uh, which basically define what people have to do and the responsibility they have to carry. But as people, we walk on level ground, right? So that's so we have to balance the two. That means uh, there are people who have roles and responsibilities. You have to fulfill it, and at the same time maintain a level ground. Don't try to become a celebrity. So we model servant leadership. Um, and um, uh, an opportunity for feedback and so on. Um, so that's one thing. Is so you know, as we model it, you know, people will imitate that or reproduce that. For instance, uh, I, I'm just thinking about you know how we nurture leaders. Uh, if the main leader is very insecure and doesn't Okay, let me put it in a positive way. If the main leader is a person who's nurturing other leaders, then what happens is the leaders whom he is raising up, they will do the same for other people. They will start thinking along the same way and they will start think, doing the same thing for other people. And, uh, you know, and that's something we have at APC, where at all levels, you know, leaders are being raised. So, we have our we have our pastoral team. That's one level of leaders. Then we have other level of leaders, of so ministry leaders, life group leaders. Then we have youth leaders, and even among the youth leaders, the youth leaders are then raising up people you know who are younger, like in the teens. Uh, they are being nurtured. So it goes all the way down till you know I, I can see it happen until all the way to the level of, and 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 I am not directly doing and I'm I, I'm I'm there in the background, but I can see you know how our youth leaders are working with the teens to nurture them, and they themselves bring them up you know um, the teens are coming up, and so the, I'm seeing the whole thing happen, and it's it's an amazing thing. But everybody has that same mindset that. I, I, I have to nurture other leaders. I mean, you know, encourage them, raise them up, you know, and 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 give them opportunity according to where they what they can do. And the same thing happens in the in in the volunteer teams. I'm not saying we, we have we are perfect, and neither am I saying that we don't have problems or issues. But the the culture is there. The culture of nurturing other leaders. The culture of giving opportunity uh, to raise up people. Uh, you know, in their spheres, in their areas, it's there. And I can see it going all the way down to the level of the teenagers who are being nurtured and raised up. You know, so that that's one of the things. We need, when you create a culture, then it goes all the way through. And it's, it's just beautiful to see that. Uh, another way we shape culture is by repeating stories. So stories that we talk about, things we talk about, uh, you know, whether it's stories of how things started, stories of certain, you know, victories, certain situations, you repeat those stories. And those stories uh, actually inspire and shape and guide behavior within the organization. So when we have staff meetings, our church staff, you know, um, uh, to our church staff and or 
to our pastoral team meetings, in our pastoral team meetings, we, we, we talk about these stories. We talk about these situations. You know, we've gone through this and we did this then and this is what we learned or we made mistakes or we learned from our mistakes. And so those stories we talk about. So what happens? Those stories, people remember those stories and those stories help shape and guide behavior. Right? Okay, don't make those same mistakes again. Or, okay, here's if God has helped us win this battle, He'll help us again. You know, and so, uh, so just stay with it. Or you know, or, or 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 we made some changes, and this is how we saw a breakthrough. So these kinds of stories that we talk within the organization, right, uh, with our church staff, with our pastors, and then some of these stories, of course, you can't share everything out in the public, but some of these stories you you know, may, may use it in public with the congregation, but generally we're talking about the culture within the organization. So these stories that we talk about and and and, and, and that we repeat, uh, uh, you know, uh, that different kinds of stories, uh, even our own failures, uh, we talk about it so that the staff or the pastors can learn from it and it, it shapes and inspires behavior and it eventually shapes the culture of the organization. Right? Um, a third way that we create culture is through rituals and practices. That means these are things we do repeatedly. Right? And, uh, and then uh, it becomes a norm. It becomes the way we do things. Right? So for example, uh, you know, as part of our church staff, uh, when somebody is leaving us, you know, um, you know, and people leave for various reasons. Sometimes uh, they get a better job, or sometimes they want to change in their in what they're doing. Sometimes they're moving out of the city, out of the country. So for various reasons, you know, and so they have been with us they're as church staff, and then uh, then they they inform us that they're going to leave. And uh, so what do we do? It's just our ritual and practice that on their last day or during their last week, we will have a farewell for them. And we celebrate their, you know, we don't look at it as, as oh, them leaving us, but we look at it as them stepping into the next phase of what God has for their lives. So we don't look at it, you know, so when any person is leaving, uh, as I'm talking about the church staff, we have a farewell, uh, 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 like a farewell get together uh, during during office hours, um, we will uh, we make it a little celebration, a celebration of what God has in store for them. So we thank them for their time with us. We let them share uh, with all the staff, you know, their experience, their journey at APC as staff. Uh, talk to us about what they're planning to do next. Uh, you know, maybe they're joining another ministry, maybe they're going to go start a church, maybe they're going to do something, you know, whatever whatever the plan is, they will share. Uh, then we, you know, we pray for them, we speak blessing on them, and then we have a little snack and things like that. So that's a ritual. You know, it's a practice where we want to celebrate. When somebody's leaving us, we don't see it as a bad thing. Oh, they're leaving us. No, we see it as a celebration of them uh, completing one phase of their journey with God and then stepping into uh, another phase of the journey with God. And so it's, it's a very healthy thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a blessing for them and for us. Yeah? So that's just one example of certain rituals or practices uh, that we have uh, that, 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 that becomes part of our culture and therefore it shapes our thinking and our behavior. Yeah? And... Uh, and so when we see these people who, who were staff, they've left us, you know, it's always a joyous thing to meet them again and say, hey, what are you doing? And so on. So it's, it's not like, oh, we look at them as enemies or look at them and say, hey, you left us. No, 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 no. We, we appreciate them. We thank, we, we see that they're joining with God and, you know, life is lived in seasons and seasons change. And, uh, and so everything is looked in a very, looked at in a very positive light. Um, the other examples, for example, you know, when children move from children's church to teen church, you know, they they like they make it like a big thing. 
a big thing is within internally like oh yeah you know you've given me you've made a transition you know god bless you and so on uh, so small things can be uh, can be made into a very f meaningful experience for people but these rituals these practices uh, are something that uh, help shape culture within the organization two other things that we can mention is um repeated communication that means um when we, uh, you know, of course, uh, within our church stuff, we have, you know, what is called as orientation and training. But then even though we we, we talk about it during orientation training, uh, we have to keep on repeating it, keep on repeating it, because people tend to forget. And so uh, we keep on bringing this up. And, hey, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what you're supposed to do. You know, and and, and typically as a leader, you're, you're doing this, you know, um, and I probably do this you know, uh, if not every day, many days in a week, where I would be um, uh, bringing something to somebody's attention, saying, hey, this has to be done like this, you know. Uh, for example, uh, in the way we uh, talk to people, you know, we tell people, you know, there are three important words, three golden words in communication, right? Uh, please, thank you, and sorry. And so when, when I see people, when they don't use that, especially in our internal communication, say, hey, I remind them, hey, use please, thank you, and sorry. You know, in, in our communication, when we're talking to people, because these are golden words and, and they mean a lot when I mean, we're communicating. Uh, and so even if somebody's sending a text message, use please, you say thank you, say sorry if you've made a mistake. Right? So, uh, so I just push it back and tell them, hey, you look at this message, you, know, you didn't say please, you didn't say thank you. And I did that, you know, just a couple of days back to one of our pastors. And I said, hey, look at look at your message. They were actually communicating with somebody else outside in the congregation. But there was no please and thank you. And I said, look, change, you know, you need to do this. So we're kind of reinforcing, repeated, these are core values in how you communicate or um, in the work we do. And if I see something that's not, that's, you know, there's, there's room for improvement or there are mistakes, then I send it back and say, hey, there are mistakes here. You know, what are we trying to do? We are trying to achieve excellence. You know, please make sure that um, you know, things are done better and so on. So people are conscious that, hey, whatever we do, we do it with excellence, do it well. Right? So these are our core values. And we need a constant repeat because we tend to forget or we might just overlook it. And, and so we need, all of us, all of us need reminders. And then uh, the last way we uh, we build culture is by rewarding behavior that's aligned to culture, right? So when somebody's doing things well, uh, that's according to culture, we reward it, we we appreciate it, we let them know that that's a good thing, that's the right thing. And of course, if if it's opposite, then we need correction. We need to tell them, hey, you've done something wrong, that's not right, uh, that's not aligned to our culture. You need to correct that and so, so both side, both ways you know we affirm and we reward behavior that's aligned to our culture and if it's against the culture we need to bring correction we need to tell them straight and right? we don't just keep quiet uh, and ignore it because that can then build into something uh, dangerous right so these are some ways you know and this these are all simple ways but uh, these are the ways we build culture within the organization uh, and the ministry let me just touch upon one more point and then we will pause for some questions. So very important to having a culture, uh, uh, to building a culture is first of all to define the core values, meaning what should the culture embody? Right? So culture is not an undefinable thing. Oh, I don't know what it is. I don't know how it's happening. No, 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 no. You have to ask, what should our culture embody? What do we want to see in the culture that we're going to create, right? So culture is always created in an organization. It's created. It doesn't happen just by itself. You're creating the culture, whether you you're intentionally or unintentionally you're creating it. So the question is, what is the kind of culture you want to see? So way back in the beginning, uh, you know, when 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 we began our journey, we we put it down, uh, and, and of course we we did a little graphic to capture it. So at the very core of our culture, starting first of all, we said our theme is Jesus. So at, 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 and so we call this the core values, right? So these define the culture that we want to create. So our theme is Jesus. We want 
everything we say and do to focus on Jesus, not on the pastor, not on some human person, not on the organization, not on some denomination, no, it's Jesus. So we don't promote APC, we don't promote the pastor's name, no, our focus must be on Jesus. Our content is the Word of God, so that's why we always preach and teach from the Scriptures. We don't preach and teach from somebody else's, you know, some denominational theology or, you know, it's the Word of God. We start with chapter and verse. Our content is the Word of God, you know, not even some nice uh, philosophy or some nice idea. No, our content is the Word of God. Our method is the Holy Spirit power. We want to depend on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we may use tools, we may use technologies, but the main dependence is on the Holy Spirit. Our passion is people. So uh, what are we passionate about? Developing people. We want to see people saved. We want to see dis people discipled. We want to see people equipped. And we want to see people released and sent out to do the will of God for their lives. Our passion is people. So it's very clear. It's about people. It's not about the organization. Of course, we want to build a strong organization. It's not about the building. Of course, we would like to have a building. Uh, it's not about you know other things. It's about people. And what is our goal? Our goal is Christ-likeness. So eventually, our goal is to bring every person to become more and more like Jesus. So these are our core values. So we defined it in the beginning. Okay, what are we going to work towards? We're working towards this, right? Now, in order to achieve this, as we interact with each other, what should be our guiding values? Well, first, uh, we want to provide opportunity for people. So as far as possible, we want to create space for people to uh, be and become what God wants them to become. So we want to prevent, provide opportunity. Uh, and I say as far as possible because obviously we cannot do everything, but things that are aligned to the vision uh, and uh, the, 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 the things that God has called us to do, in that capacity, in that space, we want to give opportunity and we want to treat everybody fairly, right? So this opportunity is not given to uh, a select group of people. All people that we are going to serve have access to those opportunities, right? So that's why, you know, volunteer teams, anybody who's part of the church can join a volunteer team as long as you have those required you know, skills and competencies that, that is needed for that particular role, anybody can step in and offer to serve, right? So that opportunity is available equally, right? The second uh, guiding value uh, that, that we want to build is unity. Always be of one heart, one mind. Anything that causes division is treated with severity. We do not tolerate that. So, you know, this is something very, very, very strict. You know, if the moment we see something causing division, we deal with it with severity. Take it out. Right? We don't tolerate that. So, unity is very important. Right. So, same thing with integrity. We want to do everything with integrity. Again, if you see anything that is causing us to compromise our integrity, we don't tolerate it. No, it's not allowed. Right, so uh, we deal with it with severity, excellence. So we want to try to do the best we can. Uh, now, excellence is never achieved, uh, you know, overnight. It's something we constantly have to work towards. So it's something we keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. In every area, we want to do things with excellence. We want to be pioneering. Pioneering means uh, trying out something. We want to be like, you know, lead the way. We're going to try out new things. Uh, some some of it may succeed, some of it may not. But pioneer, go out, step out, doing things to do things that uh, may not have been done or uh, may not be uh, ex you know experimented earlier. Try it out. So we want to have that pioneering um, um, aspect to who we are in our culture. Are not afraid to try out new things, step into new ground, go to new places, pioneer. 
and then we value relationships so in everything you know keep relationships it's okay you know yeah we will have our differences we will have differences of opinions and ideas it's okay we can discuss those things but our relationship is more important and uh, we can have different ideas but it's okay we can still you know relate to each other peacefully and and so on so relationships are important so these are things we try to maintain and if there's anything that is affecting relationships between church people we deal with it again you know so so once we've defined our core values now we try to build this into our culture right how do we build it like we went through those you know those six points here uh, uh, oh, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, five points here. And as leaders, we have to model this, share the stories that emphasize these things, uh, create rituals and practices that uh, apply these values, uh, con constantly repeat these values, hold people accountable to these, um, and affirm behavior that's aligned to these, right? So when we see people doing this, hey, that's wonderful. We appreciate that, reward them. And when it's not aligned, then we need to bring correction, right? So having these core values and uh, building that into the culture, into uh, the culture will, will then help us, you know, create the kind of culture we want, okay? So let me pause here and then uh, we'll take some uh, questions and uh, uh, see if there are any questions you have at this point. Any questions? Uh, is everyone following me uh, on this? Is it clear? Okay. All right. So, you know, in, in our day-to-day -day work that we do, uh, we have to, you know, have these conversations where uh, we hold ourselves accountable to, to these standards that we have set, right? So for instance, in our accounting, uh, so, hey, everything, you know, there's excellence, but there is also integrity, right? So, uh, Starting from myself, everything we do, hey, is it right? If it's not right, you know, make sure it's right. Find out what the rules are. What is the, what is the law? Follow the, follow the rules. Follow the law. Uh, don't do things that, you know, that violates government regulations. So these are things we have to intentionally emphasize. And, um, you know, when we work with our vendors, our vendors may have all kinds of requests, you know, oh, can you do this? Can you? So, no, 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 this is how we do it. Why? Because we want to maintain integrity in our accounting practices. You know, so in every area, uh, we've got to be applying these core values, uh, making sure that um, we, f we follow them, we abide by them, and we hold each other accountable uh, to these values, right? So it's a day-to-day -day thing. Uh, it's one thing to have it written down somewhere. It's one thing to have a little picture that tells you what the core values are. Uh, but the real test is, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, are we applying those values, right? How do we translate those core values into our real-life scenarios that we face day-to-day? -day, right? we, we need to make sure that things stay aligned uh, we hold each other accountable to those core values, and that's how we uh, we are we're building culture right? uh, into everything we do. Okay, so now let's move forward. Share this again. Right, so. The, the the reality is that sometimes even in Christian organizations, well, whether it's church or you know an, a, a parachurch organization, there is 
there could be toxic culture. That means a culture that's not good. Right? So how do you how do you identify it? How do you recognize a bad or a toxic culture? Uh, and so this little table here on at the bottom of page 40 it's just to contrast you know so when you are able to contrast you're able to recognize that something is wrong so here are some things right um, so we, we are contrasting a healthy culture in a in a in a, in a church organization in a, in a Christian organization versus a toxic culture now I'm speaking from a Christian organization but these things apply to any 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 context so a healthy culture, you know, among leaders would be consultative. Let's discuss, you know, versus dictatorial. Just do what I say. Right? So if the leader is saying, hey, let's talk about it. Let's discuss. Let's sit together and think this through. That's a good cult. That's healthy. But the leader says, hey, I'll just tell you, you just do it. Don't ask any questions. That's very dictatorial. That's not healthy. Yeah, there are certain times when the leader has to lead. He has to make the decision and he has to say, this is the way we are going to go. Fine, but that's not the norm. That those are exceptions. The norm is let's discuss, let's talk this out. Right? Uh, as a, a culture, healthy culture is encouraging, supportive. Uh, in a toxic culture, is abusive, overpowering, very suppressive. Uh, in a healthy culture, there is teamwork. Like we do it together. So uh, that means it's always us and we. So even the language that people use, it's us and we. You know. Not too long ago, I had to correct one of our pastors because he was always saying, I, 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 I. Then I had to, you know, many times I had to take him aside and say, hey, don't say I, 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 say we. Because it's not just you who got the job done. It's you and all these other people working with you. You could never have done it if you didn't have all these people helping you to do it. So when you talk about it, always say we. Don't say I because... The reality is you didn't do it by yourself. It's a team effort, right? So even the language that we use, we have to use we, not I. It's not about you getting the job. The reality is so many people are helping in getting something done. You know, So we have to give credit to the whole team, and the pastor shouldn't take credit for what was done. So always say we. Uh, you say I when you want to take responsibility for a mistake that was made. If something went wrong, that's time you say I. If something went good, that's the time you say we. Right. So these kinds of things we had to, you know, watch over and correct our people. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in a toxic culture, there's unhealthy competition within people. They, you know, each people are trying to outdo the other. So then there's no sense of teamwork. Everybody's looking at who gets the power, who gets the position, who gets the title, and that's very unhealthy. Uh, in a healthy um, culture, communication is direct and straightforward. You know, so we're not, we just tell it like it is. We're not trying to, you know, go around somebody else's back and no, just uh, talk to the person directly. You know, just for instance, um, uh, last evening, a couple of our pastors uh, reached out. They said, you know, there was a situation where in one of the ministry teams, somebody was acting up. They were not in the team they were causing problems and they said what do we do i said hey just go talk to them directly uh, go sit with them tell them to come and meet you and list out the issues tell them straight you know um there's no need to try some back door or anything just talk to them straight and said these are the problems this is your bad behavior these are the things that you're doing that's causing problems so be direct be straightforward right there's no need to manipulate and pass the word through somebody else. You know, just, of course, everything is done in love, but we have to be honest. We have to say it straight. Uh, in a healthy culture, there's freedom. Uh, the, uh, you know, within you know the our guidelines, within the boundaries that we operate, there's freedom. But in a toxic culture, there's too much of control. In a healthy culture, there's transparency. In a toxic culture, everything is secretive. Nobody knows what's going on. There is shared success in a healthy culture. In a toxic culture, there is a celebrity superstar. I am the brand, you know. Um, you know for example, um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, I think maybe two years ago, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 
um, Christianity Today. So Christianity Today is a, is a magazine that was started many, many years ago. I think it was started by um, uh, the evangelist, Dr. Billy Graham. And then, of course, it has been running for many years now. And they, they, they have a digital uh, website and they do a lot of digital content. Uh, so Christianity Today, they do a lot of uh, podcasts as well. And they analyze uh, trends and things that are happening in the Christian world. And they did a series of podcasts on uh, that was called the rise and fall of Mars Hill, and this was I think two years ago, and it was uh, I think it was like a fourteen-part episode, so it would went for a long time, uh, and uh, I was listening to it, and basically it was an analysis of uh, this church called Mars Hill, Mars Hill Church. Um, which started uh, in Seattle, Washington State, in the in the United States, um, and this started, I think, in the hmm, in the uh, in the nineties, nineteen nineties, and uh, so uh, Marshall Church um, started there. Uh, pastor Mark Driscoll was the pastor who started it. And then it, 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 at that time, it was one of the fastest growing churches in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, it just exploded in, both in Washington, in Seattle, and then they had branches open all across the US and it just exploded. And it was one of the leading churches in the US during the, those days, uh, 19, in the 90s and 2000s, early 2000s. But then suddenly, you know, when the church reached, you know, I think maybe more than fifteen thousand people, or I don't know, I don't know what it was, very big. Uh, you know, the very culture of the things shifted, they changed. Every the culture of everything just changed, and so Christianity today was doing an analysis of what happened, and so basically, what happened to Marcel was uh, it self destructed. The church fell apart, and uh, a lot of it just shut down. So they were doing an analysis of what happened, and and they were they were basically tracing, you know, how the pastor, the main pastor, who started everything, at some point, his whole, um, I don't know what to say, the heart or the mind, changed, and he became like the superstar, and you know, to the point where he. You know, he began to say, like, I am the brand of this church. And of course, he became a very influential person, pastor at that time. But I am the brand, you know. Almost thinking, like, everything exists because of me. And uh, he became very abusive to his team and to church people and very, very truthless and so on. And then everything self-destructed and disappeared. So they did a full study on that, on, on the rise and fall of Mars Hill. But the main thing, the main, one of the key problems was this, the pastor taking on a celebrity or a superstar uh, mindset. You know, when the pastor thinks he is the superstar, everything is happening because of him, it's very dangerous. And it created such a toxic culture. So many people were hurt uh, through that. And that's just one example, but there's so many examples in the, in the Christian church. Uh, we keep hearing these stories over and over again. When, uh, when, when the mind and the heart of the pastor changes, everything self-destructs, you know. So that's one of the signs of a toxic culture. Uh, a healthy culture has a mindset where, you know, we did it all together, it's about us. Uh, a toxic culture, it's all because of me. In a healthy culture, there is fairness. Everybody is rewarded based on what they actually do. Uh, entitlement uh, is a part of a toxic culture. You know, people think, people start thinking, I, I deserve this, it's my right. You know, uh, in a healthy culture, there's accountability, I'm answerable to others. Uh, in a toxic culture, there is um, people who are autocratic, there's no accountability. I don't answer to anybody. Um, uh, in a healthy uh, culture, we celebrate each other's strengths. In a toxic culture, you know, people, there's a su sense of superiority, I'm better than you, I know more than you. 
there's mutual submission in a healthy culture. In a toxic culture, you know, everybody follows the rules except me. I'm above the rules. Uh, and then, you know, we could also see it among the staff in a healthy culture. Everybody is passionate. They want to give their best. In a, in a, in a toxic culture, people are just holding on to a job. You know, they're doing it uh, because they need the job. In a healthy culture, people pursue excellence. Uh, in a toxic culture, it's just like, hey, I just want to sit here nine to five. Uh, in a healthy culture, it's about we, we must succeed. In a toxic culture, it's I just need to get my job done and I don't care what happens to others. So these are all just indications you know, of where there's a healthy culture, where there's a toxic culture. And we can see it even in church settings. And uh, there are just uh, uh, examples of both, examples of good healthy culture and there are examples of you know, bad toxic culture in an organization, Christian organization. Oh, there's another way to describe all of this. You know, uh, uh, just whatever we said, you can also put it in this little grid-like thing, uh, and you look at various you know points of emphasis in 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 uh, in understanding uh, uh, organizations' culture. Okay? Um, so uh, there is a, a good resource. Um, this is not by a Christian. This this is more of a general leadership management book. Uh, Jim Collins. Uh, he uh, he's written many books. One of his books is Good to Great, where he says how we can move from being good to being great, and. Uh, he points out, you know, these are the characteristics that help an organization move from just being a good organization to a great organization. Right? So that's kind of his the summary of his uh, book and the research he's done. And you can see if you go through it, you know, a lot of what he's written in his book seems like as though it's biblical, you know, but actually it's just a general leadership and management book. But uh, it seems like as it's Christian, but it's very interesting, you know. So he talks about uh, so what 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 causes good organizations to become great organizations? That there is curiosity, they're willing to learn, they're exploring new ideas, new things. They are rigorous. That means they are really hardworking, uh, of course. But they're not being ruthless. They're uh, they're rigorous, but they don't push it. There's a culture of discipline. Uh, they, are, they are disciplined people, they are disciplined in the way they think, and they are disciplined in the way they behave. Uh, there is humility in their leadership, uh, there is determination, uh, professional determination. They have the right people in the right jobs. Uh, they have unwavering faith in what they are doing and where they want to go. They are, fa they are brutally fact, are they honest and about dealing with facts? That means they are not in denial, they recognize where things are going right, where things are going wrong. Uh, they use technology, uh, they select and use technology to help them in their work. They have established core values which they follow. Uh, they understand uh, you know, what makes them good. So they're not trying to do everything and trying to be everything to everybody. No, they just know what they're good at and they focus on it. And they want to be good in what they are best at. Uh, and they. Uh, they have insight, they understand the economic drivers and how money works and what helps them. So uh, they have focused passion, they're fas passionate about what they do. Uh, they have realistic goals. Uh, it's not uh, unrealistic and just based on, you know, um, uh, delusion, but very practical goals. And uh, their uh, leadership or executive decisions are based on dialogue and they also are reflective they they look at things they analyze and so on so these are things that make a good organization a great organization and then these are not just steps you do occasionally but this is the way you behave all the time so when an organization behaves like this these 15 things all the time that's what helps them move from just being good organization to being a great organization. I think these 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 ideas here are very useful and uh, something that we can even use in a church or a Christian ministry 
context. All right? So I'm going to pause here for now. Um, if we have questions, we can talk about it. Uh, otherwise, we can go for a break. Any questions? Jacqueline, please go ahead. So, Pastor, when we realize that something is uh, not going right and we understand the root cause of the team, but then we also realize when we speak to them, they may disengage or not involve as much as they used to do and because of their skill, they are very skilled and experienced. So in that case, is it wiser to wait and see if the person will change or is it good that when we observe, should we go and speak to the person about like the leader or the pastor? Hmm. Okay. So uh, let me answer it in general and then, you know, in the specific situation where you said, you know about a leader or a pastor so so in general uh, if somebody is not you know uh, so let's say they're very gifted uh, they're very talented but they're not they're not behaving aligned to our culture we have to address it we address the problem uh, we give them a little time to change and if they do not change uh, we will have to, you know, release them from whatever they are doing. Uh, that means, uh, just because of their gift, we can't let them continue, right? Because, in addition to somebody being gifted and skilled, they must be aligned to our culture. Otherwise, they will be destructive, right? So, we can't excuse their skill or their uh, ability uh, 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 and just allow them to continue in a behavior that's not aligned to our culture. Yeah, am I addressing your question? Is it? Am I going the right direction? Yes, yes, Pastor. Oh, okay, okay. So we need to do that. And sometimes what will happen is when you address the behavior, uh, you know, they will have different reactions and sometimes they will withdraw. You know, and I remember, you know, this happened many years ago uh, with our worship team. I don't know if I've said these stories, so forgive me if I'm repeating some stories. Um, uh, with our worship team, we had some people in our worship team who were extremely talented. In fact, they were leading people all across India in the Christian uh, worship ministry. And they were part of our APC. They were used to come to APC, and they were part of our worship team. And, and highly skilled. You know, I mean, we you can they were, you cannot find any fault with their skill. They were well recognized all across the country. But there was a problem. Uh, the problem, uh, one of the problems was, these people only came to church on the Sunday in which they were rostered to lead worship. Mm -hmm. Other Sundays, uh, you don't see them in church. Uh, I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're traveling. Or they are, we don't see them. But one of our requirements is, look, First, you must be committed to the church. Then you get the um, opportunity to serve in the church. So the requirement to serve in the church is you must be committed to the church, especially now in the worship team. You're up on stage. You're leading the congregation in worship. You need to be with, you know, be part of the congregation. So we addressed it many times, and uh, there was no change. And then finally, I we had a meeting in our church office. I called all of them. And uh, now I, I'm not, I was not the worship pastor. The, there was a worship pastor. The worship pastor was trying to talk to them, but there was no change. And I said, okay, you know, we have to address it. I called them all. And I addressed it. Now, that was a very tense meeting. It was, um, you know, see, on one hand, we are good friends. One hand, we respect them. They are very skilled. But on the other hand, uh, the behavior, you know, because now uh, not only it is affecting them, it's affecting the younger people. You know, the younger people are saying, hey, this person only comes to church on the Sunday he's rostered. Then they will think they also can start doing the same thing, right? There's no commitment and they come and just play and go. And so it's impacting them, uh, but also impacting the younger worship team members. 
So we had this meeting in the church office and I addressed this thing and, and there were other issues as well which uh, we addressed and it was not, it was not, it was a very difficult meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it was very difficult, but we had to address it. And the sad thing is, after that meeting, uh, I think, uh, I don't know what the number was, but about three, three of them left the church. You know, mm. they left. Uh, maybe one or two stayed, but um, you know, some of these, and they were very, very good, very skilled. Very, they they left, and it's okay. You know, I uh, I have no regrets because we had to protect the culture mm. of the worship team. Uh, we want to set a good example. We have to protect our congregation. Uh, and so we had to do this, and well, this was the outcome. Uh, it's okay, right? And 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 the worship ministry went on, you know. And today we still have good people, and so on. So the answer is the answer to your question is we have to address it. Uh, there could be different reactions. Some stayed, some left. That's okay, uh, but we have to protect, you know, the standards, the values, the culture that we want to maintain. Now, when you have to address a leader, that's a you know that's a, a different situation. Uh, we'll pick it up after the break. We'll go for the break and come back. And uh, no, no, Pastor. I was just asking uh, not to address a leader. My concern hmm. was should we inform the person above us immediately when we observe oh. in the team? Uh -huh. Should we immediately let the leader know, or we should wait for that? team member to change and give them some time and then inform our leader or pastor oh okay so that i would say, uh, okay yeah i would say it's good to inform as early as possible so that you know uh, that can be addressed rather than just letting it go right uh, as soon as we are aware of it it's good to address it sometimes we let it go and then it becomes very big than necessary mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, let's take a break and uh, we'll come back uh, maybe 11.05 because, yeah, thank you. <laughs> 